Hey, this is Carl Franklin. And Richard Morris. And we just spent the last week in Breckenridge. Breckenridge, Colorado. That's where we are right now. At the Breckenridge Low Carb. The Low Carb Conference. And we had a ball. We didn't have a chance to get anything together. We got a lot of great content for you guys. As a real show. So what we're going to do is rerun. We're going to give you a teaser into some of the content that we have. The show we did about Gary Fetke. The episode about Gary Fetke. Because guess what? (laughs) <laughs> we've got him as a guest that's right <laughs> next week that's probably. for next week yeah. yeah so but we still have to edit that together well for now you'll hear the story and uh enjoy this encore presentation of two keto dudes and mad as hell Hey, Keto Freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them, and for you, I've created Music to Code By. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at music to code by Net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. In February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm about 76 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet for over two years. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of studying a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 70 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of both my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Yeah. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. So we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. We hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. So we share the great food that we can eat on this diet. Every episode, both of us share a recipe for an essential keto meal that we eat on a regular basis. So let's start podcast number 27, Mad as Hell. So Richard, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week's show? I think uh, we're all good, but who the fun cares? <laughs> oh, wasn't he great? Uh, he was awesome. He was outstanding. And uh, any salty language was doctor approved. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, literally. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, let's start with the old reprise. What is a ketogenic diet for the newbies? Shh. 
Sure. Well, a ketogenic diet can be summed up as high fat, low carb, and moderate protein. Yeah. We have less than 20 grams of carbs, although that's not an exact number. 20 grams a day. Some people do 30, 40, 50, whatever. Try not to go over. Yeah, try not to go over. I personally don't count them, but I just know what foods I can and can't eat. Most of my carbs come from green leafy vegetables and maybe a few nuts. Yeah, carbs in this diet are trace amounts only. They 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 happen to be in otherwise healthy food, but you keep the total amount of carbs below a certain level to force your body to get energy from fat. And speaking of fat, we eat a lot of that. Yeah. So in the beginning, especially... Uh, it's really important to eat fat so that you don't get hungry and slip up and eat carbs. I mean, you're essentially yeah. trying to convert your body from running on glucose to burning fat for fuel. Exactly. As time goes on, you'll eventually be using mostly your own body fat um, because if you're trying to lose weight, that's how you're going to lose weight, by by using your own body fat as your energy source. But to start off with, um, you need to train your body how to deal with fat, and the best way to do that is to give it a lot of it to eat. Exactly. And then the final, the final macronutrient, uh, the final source of energy, in fact, in our case, isn't really a source of energy. We're using protein for maintaining our bodies. We're not using protein as an energy source. We don't need a lot of protein, uh, but we need enough just to, to maintain our body, and that will be based on how big your lean body mass is. So, and there's a calculator for that. Pro- calculating your protein is probably the only mathy part of uh, a ketogenic diet. All of the rest of it is, it becomes fa- fairly much uh, innate and common sense after a while. But even the experts disagree on protein, which is interesting. The, the, the ketogenic calculator that we use says that a guy like me should be eating about 100 grams of protein a day, maybe a little less, Mm. just to maintain muscle mass and keep cellular repair working and all of that stuff. Right. And yet uh, guys like Dr. Jason Fung, who we interviewed last week, said he thinks that most of us eat three to four times the protein that we actually need. And maybe we only need 20, 30 grams of protein a day. Who knows? So, So the... I guess we could say this is what we follow. It's worked for us, yeah. but it may not be optimal and science may come out to uh, change our minds someday. In that case, we'll just adapt. And we're open to that. Uh, but in the meantime, you're going to have a, you're going to have a lot of people telling you about their versions of the ketogenic diet and that works for them. We're all unique. As we like to say in our Facebook group, we're all unique snowflakes. Um, right. And so we all have an individual vari- variability, and, and uh, so you really have to find out what works for you. Exactly. And you are your own best lab rat. Exactly. Try eating the protein in the macros, and if you find you're not in ketosis as much as you want to be, or you think you're slipping out of it, or you're not losing weight or whatever, try dialing back the protein a little bit. Your body will tell you if you're not getting enough protein. Awesome, Carl. So uh, how are you doing this week? Well, let me tell you something. That interview that we did with Dr. Fung last week significantly changed my outlook, and it doesn't happen all the time. But not only with the protein thing, but the whole flexibility of definitions that he uses, you know? People will come to him all the time, and this is what I figured out from his fact, you know, when I'm reading the fasting fact that he published all, everybody's like, what should I do? What should I do? Should I do this? Should I not do this? I read you should do that. Everybody wants to apply the brain right. to figure out what the optimum plan is. And he's like, you know, try it. Mm. Does it work? Continue. Does it not work? Do something else. And that's essentially our philosophy here, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you, you did a fast. Now, most people, most people consider a fast to be no food at all. But in fact, there's an entire continuum of different things that can be called fast. You could have just fat or you could have under 600 kilocalories per day or I mean, there's lots of different ways. And in your particular version of a fast, uh, I think you started out with not a lot of food and I think you were just bulletproof coffees. But do you want to tell us, do you want to tell us a bit about how your week went? Because you went for almost a whole week, didn't you? Yes, I will. And I will even cede the fact that what I did was not technically fasting. Okay, fine. I'm not trying to redefine the word fast. All right? Right. I started out with the intent to fast for seven days. What I ended up doing was fasting for a day, fasting for two days, had a little bit of food, fasted for another day, had another little bit of food, fasted for a whole cycle of two days, 
and then uh, slowly added a little bit here and there and did a com- this combination. I guess you could call it keto-based calorie restriction. Okay. You know, I, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. It worked. So this is what I learned from Jason Fung is that you do what works for you. Right. So it should be noted that I've been hovering between 297 and 302 for about a month and a half. And you can tell yeah. that if you've been listening to our show. I've been eating only ketogenic food during that time. So this is your classic long stall. Yeah. Uh, and I've taken a cue from Tom Seast, who's a, our friend admin and also been interviewed on our show, that he says, embrace your stalls. He didn't even weigh himself for a year when he started this thing. Right. He doesn't know where he lost weight, where he gained weight. He just did it. And you just, you know, lean into it rather than seeing it as a failure of your body to do what it needs to do. Me, I was patient. I enjoyed the spoils of my successes. Yeah. I felt great, ate my favorite kinds of keto foods, and it was all good. And that's all fine. And I did a couple of fasts in the last month and a half, but they were short, mm-hmm. 66 hours or so. And it was really only after talking to Jason Fung that I said, well, screw it. I'm going to go calorie restricted, whatever that means. Uh, for a long time. So, and let me just say that I don't recommend anyone listening, do what I did. Don't just do what I did. I yeah. came to what I did because I figured out something that worked for me. Yeah. So for example, others have tried adding a little alcohol six hours after eating and the results weren't all that great. Right. Some people had good results. Some people don't. Um, so I, I encourage yeah. you to find your own path. So I think the common thread here is Carbohydrate uh, restriction. Uh, totally. No matter what you're doing, you're not eating any carbohydrates at all. And Absolutely. You're really using. You're really letting your body be a guide. Your daughter Emmy said said this. You know, she's very wise. Your girl. She said, um, "You really have to pay. Learn to pay attention to your body because it'll tell you what you need." And in the case of hunger, hunger really is a is a message saying, "I'm running out of energy now." On a ketogenic diet, you respond to that by giving it some fat. So I like to look at this as as an end goal. Where do we want to be when we finally end up uh, on this ketogenic diet? And for yeah. me, that is intuitive eating, being able to eat what food that I, I that I feel like eating, that I'm and respond to my hunger and rely on my hunger to appropriately fuel me, mm. not to expect my hunger to make me three hundred pounds again. Yeah. But to make my hunger store a little bit of energy when I need to store it a little bit of energy, draw down a little bit of stored energy when I've got too much. And so that really is for me is the goal. The goal for me is to rely on hunger, uh, to be the to be the the fuel gauge for my body. What's interesting to me is that when people hear this, they say, Yeah, but I got into trouble over the last twenty years by listening to my body. But you've been listening to the sugar burning body. Right. And the sugar burning body wants things that aren't good for you. Yeah. And once you eliminate that, now you can clearly hear real signals, real hunger, yeah. real satiation. Yeah. And this is a signal that you have not been able to hear. That's absolutely true. The the thing about sugar is the minute that it go the that something sweet is put into your mouth, that some of that uh, glucose is making it across uh, the uh, the barrier into you into the into the blood vessels in your mouth and straight into your bloodstream. So your body gets to used to the fact if I need energy, the fastest way to do it is to get something sweet in my mouth. Yeah, and 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 that it it basically short circuits. It short circuits our mechanism for dealing with. Hey, I need energy really quickly, and yeah. we just we just get to the point where we think if I need if I get the message that says I need energy very quickly, I need a Snickers bar stat because <laughs> you know you're not you're not yourself when you're hangry. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. um, you know once you break that, once you can uh, separate that uh, mechanism out, uh, you become a lot better at, at identifying real hunger. Yeah. So that's what I did. And like I was saying before, I also pretty much had some alcohol almost every night, every night except for one. Okay. And that either is a couple glasses of wine or some bourbon or whatever. And I was losing pretty much two pounds a day until I got 10 pounds down. Any week that you can lose 10 pounds is, uh, is, is pretty good. Yeah. And what's interesting is that 10 pounds came off in five days. Okay. In the last three days, I just sort of surfed at the same weight. And that's when I said, you know what? Okay, I'm I'm done. I'm going to just 
wait this out. And then uh, over the next few days, I've pretty much stayed the same. Yeah. So I've I've leveled off. You know, I've I've come to a new plateau, which is wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. That is awesome. Thanks. So how did you do this week? I've had a great week. As you know, last week during our show, during the Jason Fung show, I was talking about the fact that I'd had new blood results. And yeah. It, they confirmed that um, I was no longer diagnosable as mm-hmm. insulin resistant. My insulin, fasting insulin rates was were down from 20 to 13. Wow. Which is still, ho- it's still high normal, but hey, I'm normal. <laughs> yeah, right. So, you know, this is the third of the impossible diseases. I mean, uh, we are told that diabetes is a pro- an exclusively progressive disease. Once you get it, it only gets worse. Right. Well, I was I was non-diabetic within five months of uh, starting uh, a ketogenic diet. Yeah. We're also told that a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease only ever progresses. In fact, it, the, the instances of remission are so rare that uh, that doctors say that it, it, it never goes backwards. Well, mine went backwards. I yeah. have a CAT scan that shows a fatty liver and another CAT scan that I did two years after starting keto yeah. where the the pathologist – was arguing with my doctor that there is no way that I was type 2 diabetic because yeah. I showed no sign of it in my liver. Yeah. And the third thing is insulin resistance. You're told you're born with insulin resistance. It will only get worse. Your insulin level, once you start eating a large amount of carbohydrate uh, and you start living this lifestyle, you, 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 your insulin resistance will get worse. Your compensatory hyperinsulinemia will only get worse. Well, in fact, by... Over the past three months, by adding in a three-day, 72-hour fast once a month, I've been able to reduce my fasting insulin, which is not a complete reversal of insulin resistance, but no. I'm non-diagnosable as insulin resistant. That's right. And you know, people have said to me, oh, yeah, but if you go back to eating carbs, you're going to be diabetic again. That was the case when I was born. Yeah. The case, the case when I was born was if I ate a lot of carbs, I would become diabetic. So wait a minute. You're telling me that if I take poison, <laughs> then something bad will happen. So, yeah. <laughs> so by all means, why are you abstaining from poison? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It doesn't does make it? any sense at all. So, so no, I've had an awesome week. I've I've gone off metformin. I now have. Yeah. I, my my doctor I, my doctor told me two years ago I could go off metformin if I wanted to. Uh, I asked her if I could stay on, and she said, "Sure, it's a low dose," because um, I really wanted to te- keep a lid on my blood glucose. Yeah. Um, so I've been off I've been off all drugs as of two weeks ago, and I've been tracking my glucose, and it's going up just a very small amount, but it's still you know it's gone up from like uh, five point two to five point four. So it's 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 still great. Well, Richard, stories like yours and mine, they aren't unique stories. We hear tons of similar stories of people who have oh, yeah. gone on a ketogenic diet with fatty liver and type 2 diabetes and completely reversed it. We know of doctors, we know these doctors personally, who have yeah. hundreds of patients that have done the same thing all with the ketogenic diet. There, And if you don't want to hear anecdotes, go read the science. There have been dozens and dozens and dozens of studies now confirming the safety and efficacy of the ketogenic diet for reversing type 2 diabetes. So that boggles the mind and begs the question, if this is the science and this is reality, why is everybody still lying to us? There are... 54 randomized controlled trials comparing a low fat with a low carb diet and in 43 of them the low the low carb diet came out better and in 5 of them the low fat diet came out better so you know it is reasonable that somebody can say well you know the science is is not entirely settled but if you actually look at those randomized controls trials the data from the 5 that came out with a low-fat diet being better, was not significant. It was not a significant amount of difference. Zero of those trials had a significant um, weight loss advantage for a low-fat diet. But mm. if you look at the tri- the 43 trials that uh, had a that saw a better weight loss for a low-carb diet, 43 of those were significant, so you know it. It that you can say that there's that the science is equivocal, but 
the the truth of the matter is that the science on the side of the low carb diet is producing significant results and the science on the low fat diet has never produced significant results there you go and that brings us to an interesting story that we want to bring to everybody's attention this week and richard this uh came across your desk did it not so you know that we mention at the top of every show that we're not doctors. Yeah. It's not really a disclaimer as much as a suggestion to get your own doctor involved into your own health and engage with them about the diet that you're about to do, especially if you're on medication for glucose control. Sometimes you get an awesome doctor and they understand what you're doing with ketogenic diets and fasting, and that is great. And sometimes you get maybe a more conservative doctor who doesn't know what a ketogenic diet is, and all they know is that ketones are a bad thing. You might have to help them along with maybe a copy of Art and Science of Low-Carb Living from yeah. Finney and Volek. Uh, or you might have to look for another doctor. That some, sometimes is the only solution. But sometimes you get an awesome doctor who has done the research and is fully up to date on diet as a treatment for chronic metabolic diseases like diabetes, and they are not allowed to advise you. What? Yes, I know. So, so I'd like to introduce to you a story from an Australian doctor named Gary Fecky, who is a cancer survivor and a, an orthopedic surgeon. And he, for a living, he amputates diabetic feet. Oh. It's horrible. He used to remove in Tasmania one a month, and he's now doing several a week. Oh. So his specialty is responding to the really bad end of the diabetic spectrum. Yeah. This is when people have not had good glucose control. Uh, they've been treated with uh, ph pharmaceuticals and uh, lifestyle interventions that haven't worked, that haven't managed their glucose properly. And by the time they get to him, the damage to their vascularization means they're only going to lose more and more limbs. And it's yeah. a, you, know, you start losing toes, you start losing fingers, and then you, you lose whole hands, whole feet, and um, eventually you – most likely have a cardiovascular disease that, that will uh, terminate your life early. So diabetes is a horrible, horrible disease. If you're dealing with that end of the picture, then you can must only look at this in frustration at the system that's generating so many diabetics. All of a sudden, from the 70s onwards, we're producing so many diabetics. It's outstanding. Mm. In Australia, we do, every week we amputate 80 diabetic feet. And in, in the UK, it's 135 diabetic feet every week. And in the, the US, I haven't been able to find exact statistics, but it looks like about 1,600 diabetic feet every week are being amputated in the US. So Gary Fecky is at the end of this entire process of diabetic feet. Yeah. Uh, now, the Australian Health Practitioners Regulatory Authority advised him in 2014, in particular, that he does not provide specific advice or recommendations on the subject of nutrition and how it relates to the management of diabetes or the treatment and or prevention of cancer. Now, for two years, he's been dealing with this. It's been in, it's been in secret. He wasn't able to know who his accuser was. Uh, he wasn't. A, he was basically told, if you want to keep your medical license, you're not allowed to talk about nutrition. And has he been treating his patients with a ketogenic diet? Yes, Gary has been advising patients to when they first come to him, if they are overweight. Uh, th this is not just diabetics, but anybody who requires knee surgery or anything like that. If they are overweight, he advises them that if they remain overweight, that the surgery won't help them and he gives them advice on how to lose weight. His part of his preoperative care is to get the person's weight down so that uh, orthopedic surgery is successful for them. And he advises the high-fat, low-carb diet? Yes, you can find him all over social media, on YouTube, for example, giving presentations on carbohydrate limitation as a, mm. as a, a dietary approach. Wow. Um, he is extremely erudite, and hmm. when I first started, there was a lot of doctors who were obviously low-carb, Low carb proponents, yeah, know, the people who'd written people who'd written books about it, people who were involved with the Atkins Group. Mm -hmm. At the time, I felt these people had an ulterior motive, and I couldn't entirely trust what they said right. with was accurate without independent um, uh, uh, support by other doctors. Right. And I, I I refer really to doctors like uh, Ted Naiman and Gary Fetke and uh, Ken Sakaris and a bunch of other doctors who had no reason to say 
that low carb diets were an appropriate. Right. Uh, they weren't selling bars or anything, or they they weren't selling like, selling candy bars to help you lose weight, and they yeah. weren't sell, selling exogenous ketones or whatever. These mm. were just doctors who dealt with the problem at the coal face and uh, and and identified the problem early and have been trying to give us a solution. Yeah. And literally, it was people like Gary Fetke saying this about their diet that encouraged me to get onto it. Now, as you wow. know. I've already saved my own life. You saved mine. I, there you go. And 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 you and I are both saving other people's lives. I mean, we we have thousands of people in our in our Facebook group, for example, who tell us every day every that day. their diabetes is reversed. So his wife Belinda is uh, taking over the nutritional part of his blog, which is uh, nofructose.com. dot mm-hmm. She's a former registered nurse. She's uh, her license has lapsed, so she fears no. Uh, so she doesn't fear losing her license for yeah. explaining the nutritional basis behind carbohydrate right. um, restriction. They have a uh, business called Nutrition for Life in Tasmania, which does face to face appointments and Skype appointments th- throughout Australia on in, on a one to one basis. They support Australians um, going on a low carb diet. Yeah. So if this guy has been completely silenced, what can we do about this? I mean, it seems an outrage that a doctor can be told by anybody, you can't say that. And yet anybody else, including us with no medical degrees or anything, can say whatever we want. Right. It's, it's, it's outstanding. It comes down to the fact that, uh, that dietitians and physicians – separated uh, several decades ago and they set up a line of demarcation. The physicians decided, well, diet is not really a hard science. It's a soft science. It's not a hard science like cutting bits out of people or giving them pharmaceuticals and chemicals to uh, to modify their bodily processes. Mm. Uh, diet, diet is a soft science. So we'll, 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 we'll cede that to the dietitians. We'll let them be experts in that territory, and we won't concern ourselves with diet. Yeah. But the problem is that the doctor's responsibility to first do no harm is to identify the basis of your disease. The basis of a metabolic disease mm. is diet. Yeah. It's your metabolism. It's how you're fueling it. Yeah. And so doc- doctors can't get away with saying we're not going to be involved with diet because diet is the most critical aspect of a metabolic disease and this particular metabolic disease diabetes is a tsunami that is going to overtake our western nations it already has and in fact the biggest problem i think is maybe subtle but it's absolutely there and it's the economic incentives you know we're well oh man now i'm just getting angry (laughs) <laughs> I, I i started out angry on this so i've uh, i i apologize look uh, i'm i'm going to leave the story of gary fetke for now we're going to hopefully come back and go into more detail about it right but this is not the first time that this has happened this happened with tim noakes in south africa he's still going through a trial that's gone on for over two years, yep. uh, where the 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 in exactly the same sort of circumstance. But the only thing with Tim Noakes is that the forces arrayed against the advice to go low carb were stupid in that they allowed it to be an open trial, and so that basically gave Tim Noakes a platform to explain exactly the science behind it. Yeah. And uh, you know, Gary Feck, he wasn't afforded that. He wasn't even told who his accuser was. He was basically told there's been yeah. a complaint, and you're not allowed to know who made the complaint, <sighs> and uh, and this is the and this and, and basically we will not allow you to talk about nutrition. We will not allow you to talk about the basis of the metabolic disease. Back in your box, Gary Fetke, and just cut people's feet off. Well, you know we're going to have to put our anger down for a few minutes because we've got some mail. 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 Okay, so I've got a question that uh, came into our Facebook group. Uh, and if you want to join us on Facebook, there's over 2,000 people there already. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was only 1,000, so it's growing it's crazy. leaps and bounds. <laughs> it is. Uh, and you just go to fb.2keto.com to join yeah. us on Facebook. So uh, this question is from Ryan Swartz, and it was a question for my type 2 diabetic friends. My father-in-law is type 2, and he eats like complete dog do. 
That's yeah. not exactly the word that he used, but <laughs> uh, so yet he thinks that when he eats sugar and then takes metformin or something else, his sugar in the morning is lower than normal, that he's doing just fine. It, it's, ve- it's very irrational and he doesn't care. Really, for example, he had a pizza for dinner with two root beers and a piece of cake for dessert, took his pills and his sugar was normal in the morning. What are the long-term consequences of this? We have young kids who want to have their grandfather around. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it, I've see heard it this over and over again. I see it all the time. The, um, I guess the first question is what is his average glucose over three months? And that's known as the HbA1c test. He might be hitting the ideal glucose point when he tests every day, but his glucose might be swinging wildly during the day. So the HbA1c will, will tell you what his average is. And you can actually use the average glucose, uh, control for a person to determine what their outcomes are going to be. Yep. Um, if, if he's controlled with pharmaceuticals, he's probably up around six and a half or seven. Um, and now that, and that's really where doctors, doctors will tell you they want you to be between six and a half to seven. Yeah. Now, as a type two diabetic eating a low carb diet, my HbA1c is 5.2%. And I'll, I'll link in the show notes sh- charts uh, that show you their hazard rates for uh, strokes and heart attacks as their HbA1c goes higher. But, for example, if his HbA1c is 6.5%, he is twice as likely to have heart disease than if it was 5%. Wow. He would also be three times more likely to die of a stroke than if it was 5%, Mm. and he would be twice as likely to die from any cause in any year if he had 6.5% as compared with if he had 5%. Wow. That's huge. It's a massive, and 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 you know, Ryan says that you know his father-in-law is proud that he's got seven and a half millimoles of sugar reading. Well, he you know he may have a, an HbA one C up around seven and a half percent, which my charts don't even go that high. Mm. Um, now, if and, and he's you know his father-in-law says this is exactly the range that his doctor wants to see. And I would respond that, of course, that's exactly where the doctor wants to see it because doctors have blunt and imprecise tools for fighting high blood glucose. If they give you too high a dose, they run the risk of your glucose overshooting and going too low, which could put you into a diabetic coma. They wouldn't want that. They wouldn't want that, no. It isn't good for a doctor's malpractice insurance premiums to be regularly medicating their patients into comas. So they want you just high enough so that you know, you'll know you last for a- several years. Yeah. And not too low that you run the risk of diabetic coma. Exactly. And so they aim for close enough, seven and a half, seven percent HPA1C or between seven and seven and a half millimoles per liter, or in the US form that's one hundred and twenty five to one hundred and thirty five milligrams per deciliter. Mm. The thing is, every one percent increase in HPA1C is a twenty three percent greater risk of a foot amputation. And that's quite a risk that a doctor is taking with your dad's feet to get himself a lower insurance premium. Well, I'm getting more angry by the minute here listening to oh, these stories. It's just really pissing me off today. Um, this is a message that also showed up on our Facebook group right. from uh, Janice Sternfeld. And she was sharing uh, her friend's photo. And this friend's name is Don, D-O-N-N. And it's someone posted the school lunch menu from my elementary school days back in the mid 60s. And this is the U.S. Department of Defense dependent schools on the island of Okinawa. Wow. Not exactly low carb or keto, but real food and no desserts. Mm. Whole milk, nothing low fat, and we were so skinny. Now, this is really interesting. I'm going to read you some of these. And sure. while they're definitely not low carb, as she said, they're, they're also not low fat, but check this out. Monday, uh, chicken soup, Spanish macaroni, buttered green beans, tossed salad, bread and butter, chilled mm-hmm. fresh fruit, fresh milk. Here's another one. Tomato soup, chicken a la king on toast, buttered spinach, tossed salad, ice cream, fresh milk. Wow. Here's another one. Cream of celery soup, roast pork, mashed potatoes and gravy, applesauce, buttered carrots. Notice how there's a buttered vegetable in every... I think I'm going to do a buttered vegetable for my recipe today. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. In honor of this. Here's another one. Onion soup, roast beef, mashed potatoes and gravy, buttered beans, vegetable salad, bread and butter, chilled pineapple, fresh milk. 
and it yeah. pretty much goes on that way for the for the whole thing. So it's a modest amount. It's a modest amount of uh, of fruit. Like there's a piece of pineapple. I mean, you're uh, and you're carbs. Prob- you're, you're pr- it's probably regional too. So you know, yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't be canned in syrup pineapple. It would be pineapple cut from a pineapple. I don't know. Maybe it would. Um, who knows? But I mean, the interesting thing is they weren't afraid of butter. They weren't afraid of fat. Yeah. And uh, you know, then as she said, you know, everybody was thinner and happier back then. Yeah. No. No uh, low fat milk at all. Nope. Yeah. No. Nope. All full cream milk. Wow. No soda. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, mm. incredible. Incredible. So it, just, it just and that that was in the sixties. That was before we started all this low fat craze that 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 exploded us all. Well, thank you, Janice. Uh, Richard, let's do one more. Sure. I've got a message here from that was on our Facebook group. It was from Paul A. Mastrangeli Jr. And he says as follows. Okay, as a stroke of luck, I had a follow-up visit with an endocrinologist today for an unrelated matter, and he agreed to administer the insulin assay test. Unfortunately, he was just intending to perform a single-point insulin test, though, after some discussion, he did agree to do the insulin assay, but I needed to provide him the protocol. My reaction was, huh, I'm looking for an insulin assay test, thinking it should be something standard. After scouring the Two Dudes site um, and uh, reviewing ref- references for both from, from the site and from others, I found that this is a test administered very differently for different needs and at the discretion of different doctors. The easy question is, does Dr. Kraft define his recommended pro- protocol in Diabetes Epidemic and New Book? Or if not, the tougher question may require a doctor to answer, and that is, should the protocol as outlined in 2.2.1, with this is in Catherine Croft's paper on uh, her analysis of Dr. Kraft's data, um, and he, he's asking, is that uh, protocol as outlined in that paper uh, the appropriate one and he has been directed to provide a one page document after initially trying to provide the why insulin why hyperinsulinemia matters article now now it's it's you shouldn't have to do home do homework <laughs> to to get a basic test but i think the the ideal person to answer this could be Ivor Cummings so carl do you think we could get Ivor involved uh, yeah, let me call him. Ivor, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, Carl. Hi, how you doing? Uh, not too bad, and yourself? Just great. We wanted you to come on the show and talk about the Kraft Insulin Assay, and uh, we'll, we can just start with Paul's question. What do you think of that situation? Is that a common occurrence that people don't know um, about this test? Well, absolutely. It's very common because one of Kraft's points was for many years, he's been trying to get this known. Uh, It's the earliest laboratory diagnosis for diabetes, and you may be able to pick up diabetes 20 years or more before you get the diagnosis. Is this something that anyone can do? Why, Why is it so secret? Is it complicated? Well, it's not overly complicated. I'll describe it briefly as per Kraft's protocol. So, you uh, like an oral glucose tolerance test, uh, you drink 100 grams of glucose or 75 grams nowadays, it doesn't matter too much. Um, But then instead of just measuring the glucose regularly in your blood after drinking the glucose, you measure the insulin. And this is very important because the way the insulin behaves in response to the glucose you drank is much more important and gives a much earlier signal of dysfunction than the glucose does. So Kraft discovered this in the early days of insulin measurement. He realized after doing 500 or 1,000 people this way, and what he did was they drank the glucose, and at a half an hour later, one hour, two hour, three hour, and four hour, he measured their blood insulin. And he got the pattern of insulin response over five hours in a graph. And after doing five or 600 people, he realized, wow, there's very distinct different types of people. And there were five different patterns. And he realized from his research and from doing thousands more people that there was only one pattern, pattern one, which actually was healthy and non-diabetic. Mm, there were many right. patterns that actually he realized were essentially diabetic. 
So is he saying that pattern two leads to pattern three, pattern three leads to pattern four, which leads to pattern five? So like once you're on the treadmill, you are, you know, if you, if you don't change any of your dietary habits, uh, that you're doomed to diabetes? Broadly speaking, yes, that when you have pattern two, three, or four, you are essentially diabetic. And he called it diabetes in situ or occult or hidden diabetes, because most of these guys would all have an okay fasting glucose, but physiologically, they were diabetic. And yes, if you keep that going, eventually, you will generally fall off the wagon and your blood glucose will go out of control. And that's when the world will recognize you as diabetic but that's very late right. and the damage to your body is happening long before the world will recognize you with glucose as diabetic as soon as your insulin goes up you start getting that damage to the to your blood vessels don't you that that was exactly his point that when you're hyperinsulinemic you are beginning the damage so why not do his test catch it and a very interesting thing was he himself knowing this over 30 years, and he did 16,000 people with this test. So he wow. had no doubt. Yeah. And that's a five hour test kind of sitting in a hospital ward, you know, and taking seven or eight blood measurements. But he uh, realized that if you did this test, you could catch people really early. And then he also knew how to fix it because he had patients back in 1972 where he took them from the bad pattern, two, three, or four, and brought them right back down to a good response. Wow. Yeah. What he did was a few months of low-carbohydrate treatment uh, brought their pattern back into line. This hmm. is blowing my mind. And yet another yeah. story of how we knew carbs were a problem and we knew how to cure diabetes in the 70s, and yet we, this is ignored. We knew it in silos. That's the problem. It was known in silos and the information couldn't penetrate. Exactly. So medicine is essentially siloed. Where, where I work in engineering with large complex programs, uh, you must have integrators. So that's a crucial role. And these are engineers who know all the different areas and they spot the major issues and they integrate. And without them, we'd, yeah. be, we'd be gone. But in medicine, they're all specialized, stratified, and there don't seem to be any integrators. Now, Kraft was an integrator because he took endocrinology, nuclear medicine. He was a pathologist also for all the heart autopsy. Wow. So he wow. was an integrator, and he researched, and he put all the pieces together. However, when he began to try and tell people this, no one wanted to know. Cholesterol was already well on its way to becoming the big baddie. Um, and it's important for people to know that cholesterol issues, cholesterol is really, it's, it's taking uh, orders from insulin signaling and hormonal signaling. It's kind of a proxy for the real stuff. Right. There is truth in cholesterol measures when they're off. You know, it, it means something's going on. But overwhelmingly, it means something wrong with your in insulin signaling. <laughs> so yeah. Kraft realized the core but of course, no one would listen to him because insulin was complex. It was new. Uh, cholesterol was established as the thing. And basically, no one wanted to even consider that carbohydrate could be a problem because they told everyone that fat was a problem. I also think they were all addicted to carbs. Yeah. Everyone was addicted to carbs. The industries had pharmaceutical had got behind cholesterol. Food had got behind cholesterol. I mean... You could lower your cholesterol with vegetable oils, which are cheap as chips, you know. Yeah, literally, yeah. Everyone was invested in cholesterol, a simple hypothesis, incorrect, of course, uh, and all the foodstuffs had gone that way. And here was Kraft saying, hold on, guys, insulin's where it's at, and actually all of your food advice and dietary advice, um, I think you're wrong. So he spent 30 years in the wilderness, basically. I was talking to my friend George yesterday, who remembers a guy that we both know in, uh, in, in the local area who, I'm not sure if he had diabetes or not, but just chowing down on Twizzlers all day long, saying, well, they're fat-free. That's the craziness. We interviewed, um, 
oh, a few guys in San Diego, actually. But Vinny Tortorick, we caught in LA last week, myself and Dr. Gerber, and we interviewed him on Malibu Beach. And he was saying that, that these cookies were coming out like with 600 calories in a bag and uh, they were fat free. So people are almost thinking, wow, well, it's only 600 calories. They're fat free. So basically people were eating the whole packet. Yeah, like a free pass to ruin yourself. Exactly. Um, but once that ship set sail, as we know, the last 30 or 40 years have been what they've been. And now we can look around us and see see what's resulted. So I first learned of this from Richard, uh, who posted a video a interview that you did with Dr. Kraft last year in uh, 2015, in July, I think, right? July 15, yeah. And he was 94, 95 years old? Yeah, I think he was 94 then, 95 now, yeah. Yeah, and, and is how is he doing? Have you seen him lately? Yeah, I dropped in on him on my way to New York uh, last week uh, for an evening, and I got a, around 90 minutes of footage as well after having dinner with him. So Dr. Kraft was a medical captain in World War II. He had some great stories about the initial age of antibiotics. He was there. Um, he went through tuberculosis and... Like he was there at the start of the age of antibiotics and in his career spanned right up to 2000. So, and being a pathologist with over 3000 autopsies he personally conducted and also a doctor in nuclear medicine of which there were only a handful in the States back in the seventies, he was in a unique position. Um, so he's an extraordinary man and uh, he worked all this out. And I might just briefly go back uh, to the question, Carl or Richard, from the, the viewer sure. uh, or the, the person who wrote the letter in. So, yeah, this five-hour test is, is quite complex and it uh, requires a lot of investment of time. So there is a quick way to do it. So rather than doing five hours or six or seven measurements of insulin, the really important one is the one that two hours after you drink the glucose. So Kraft clarified from his statistician from his 16,000 people that really if, you're, if your two-hour insulin, two hours after drinking the glucose is below 30, you're pretty much highly likely to be fine. And if it's above 40, you're pretty much highly likely to have the problem. So it's a very easy way to do the test. Now, if you're between 30 and 40, okay, maybe you get a three hour and a four hour later and you look deeper at the patterns. But for the vast majority, below 30 at two hours or above 40 gives you the answer. So you could uh, take a, a drink of pure glucose, what, 75 mils or 100 mils of pure glucose uh, uh, two hours before going to get a regular blood test. And as long as insulin was on that test, the doctor the doctor need never know why you're getting it. It's exactly what I was going to recommend, Richard. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's exactly where I went to originally, because if you talk to your doctor about this, and, and like uh, Paul, um, he probably won't know what you're talking about. I mean, to most doctors, insulin is a drug you have to give diabetics. They don't really know anything about insulin metabolism in the body, the signaling system, leptin, ghrelin. You know, they, they, in fairness, they don't really know. So if you ask for an insulin test, the most they'll expect is a fasting insulin. You just fast, right. you get an insulin. But that's very noisy. So yeah, a high fasting insulin is bad. But, you know, a lot of people with a highish one are okay. A lot of people with a low one are not okay. So it's noisy stuff. So the easiest way with the doctor is you don't need sending at all. You take 75 grams of glucose in a drink um, and then at 8 a.m. you drink it because you know at 10 a.m. the doctor is going to take a blood draw and he'll just take an insulin, a fasting insulin. He won't know you've drunk the glucose and when the result comes back, he's going to get a shock because he's going to say, wow, your fasting insulin is 22 and then you'll smile and say, don't worry about it, doc. It's under 30. I'm good. <laughs> Give me a couple of days. I'll turn that around. Watch this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And it makes it easier because you don't have to get into all the explaining. Now, if you're a little late, so say the doctor 10 a.m. appointment and he's going to draw at, say, 10.10, well, you drink at 8.10. If he's off by 10 or 20 minutes or you get delayed, you, I have a, an Excel sheet to kind of interpolate back, but you probably don't want to be a mile off. 
um, roughly two hours, they'll be okay. Wow. And is there anything that you can do just with a regular blood meter, a blood glucose meter? Well, the interesting thing is from Kraft's work, um, of the people who failed his test, the early test for diabetes, around 90% of those guys had an okay fasting glucose. Wow. So a fasting glucose is not much good unless you really know what you're doing. Um, An oral glucose tolerance test you can do with a simple meter. So you can drink the 75 grams and check yourself at one hour, two hour, three hour. And that's pretty good. Um, But around 50% of people who failed Kraft's test would pass an oral glucose tolerance. So you can, with a simple glucose meter, do an oral glucose tolerance test. And it's pretty good measure to do but you could get a false positive you can that's exactly the problem so a low carber will tend towards getting an apparently bad result in their glucose tolerance and that's confusing the beauty of the insulin is a it's way more specific way better but also a low carber will not get a false positive they get a low insulin why don't we have insulin blood meters like we have glucose meters a huge question that's asked a lot. So glucose is a large molecule with a very simple method to electronically measure it, the little meters. Uh, insulin needs an immunoassay, and it just needs exotic equipment. And yeah. I, I, someday, perhaps, they'll have some immunoassay or some other method in a small meter, but no one's really pushing for it either. Because as we saw with Kraft, no one in industry really wants to go down the rabbit hole of insulin because that's where all the dirty secrets lie. One of the things that strikes me is that our smartphones are so smart that this jack at the bottom is both a headphone and a microphone jack. And the microphone jack is nothing but an analog to digital converter. And so you can, if you have the right analog signal to send into that, say from a sensor or something that reads blood glucose, you can get measurements. And it's just a matter of making the hardware that interprets the, those analog signals correctly or that interprets the, the data correctly and sends it up as an analog signal. And then the software that can read that and actually turn it into something. So I can imagine a future where not only do we have, and we probably have them already, you know, iPhone glucose meters, but iPhone and, you know, Android phone, whatever, smartphone, insulin. Immunoassays, yeah. And assays. And all sorts of other things. Like, I, I can only see it getting technology getting better for people who want to do home labs. I would just toss one spanner in there, into that mechanism there. We're currently going away from giving patients access to this information. In Australia, for example, it used to be that uh, I would be able to get uh, uh, glucose testing strips uh, subsidised by the government. Well, the new policy now is to give people HbA1c's four times a year and basically take uh, a glucometer away from type 2 non-insulin dependent type 2 diabetics because the, the signal is too noisy for glucose. So I mean, what they were doing is they were giving giving uh, somebody would be recently diagnosed diabetic. They'd be given a glucometer. They'd be shown how to basically use it. They'd be sent home, and they'd be testing all at the wrong times. Uh, you know, when they're not eating something or uh, whatever, and and so the information that they were getting back from these things was unreliable. The doctors prefer to have just an HPA one C, which averages glucose over three months, and. It's it's the path of least resistance. Well, that's the way that the doctors are heading, but that's even more yeah. reason for the general public to get behind something that they can plug into their phone, right? Yeah, no doubt. Exactly, and uh, that's actually quite worrying. I can understand why for cost purposes and all the other problems, but um, ironically, whatever about insulin, type 2 diabetics obviously need to be going low-carb, and they need to be eating to their meter using yeah. a glucose meter and tracking and and always keeping their blood glucose under control and like in it as you know in engineering you need a kind of point of use localized short loop feedback control that's yes. a great system yep. i mean imagine yeah. a production line that 
you know, instead of measuring temperature constantly and, and, and controlling it carefully in a temperature sensitive process, imagine you said, okay, well, every three months, a guy's going to come in and measure the temperature. It's absurd. <laughs> it is. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but but in the, in in this case, the 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 Diabetic Association in Australia has recommended this new way of doing things because for them it's easier to pharmaceutically uh, get you to uh, an HbA one C around seven to seven and a half. A doctor doesn't want to go much lower because of the possibility of medicating you into a diabetic coma. So you know once you get down to six or five and a half, they start get freaking out. Or oh, if my medication is just slightly wrong or this patient is just, you know, is just slightly incorrect, then um, they could be in a diabetic coma. And so out of a an abundance of caution for not putting people into diabetic comas, the medical association and the diabetic association are willing to let me as a type 2 diabetic have an HbA1c of between 7 and 7.5 instead of my current HbA1c, which is 5.2, which I manage because I eat to my meter. You know, Richard, this is the other side of the technology sword, isn't it? Right? You know, we, 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 we tend to think that we have more power in our intellect and our as doctors to prescribe the right medications and technologies and all of these things. And because the body is obviously too stupid to do it by itself, right? And this is exactly what Jason Fung talks about all the time. Let the body do what it does. Get out of the way. You know, stop with the medications. Just eat the right food and everything will work itself out. Mm. Well, in this case, a a two to two and a half to uh, percent increase in HbA1c increases my chance of a, of a foot amputation, increases the chance of me becoming blind, requiring dialysis, a new kidney, and cardiovascular disease. Yeah, and 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 they're willing to take that risk with my my organs in order to to lower their insurance premiums for the possibility that they might put somebody into a diabetic coma. So you know. As far as I'm concerned, a glucometer is the greatest invention ever for diabetics, all kinds of diabetics, and right. it gives us power. It literally gives us power. And as long as you know how to use it, right? I mean, this is the thing they're afraid of. It, a lot of people don't wash their hands before they prick their finger. And, you know, you right. you get it dirty or you, you, there's some sugar on your finger or something like that, and you're going to get wacky results. Yeah, exactly. So... And the other thing is that all of these people, and as this craft pointed out so clearly in the interview, and you can Google Fat Emperor Craft with a K or, or Ivor Cummins, you'll find it. But he pointed out that, unfortunately, they don't understand diabetes, and they still don't. Back in the 70s, they thought it was a disease of high glucose. Now, glucose is only listening to the orders. It's a disease of high insulin, type 2. Yeah. And he said even in the 60s and 70s, when it came up, they just could not believe. They, they firmly believed it was a disease of high glucose. And he said, amazingly, to this very day, that, that mistaken belief exists, that it's a high glucose disease. And it's not. It's a high insulin disease that leads to a dysfunction in signaling that leads to your glucose going out of control. Um, but because they don't really understand it, they just see it as glucose and they think seven is okay. It's better than being 10. And they do what you're describing, Richard, which is an absolute disgrace because yeah. you, you can live the full life expectant. And type one's the same. If they low carb and they keep their HB down to 5.2 or 3, they keep their blood glucose under control, they can live the full life expectation of a human. But type 1s usually live around 12 or 15 years less, and they have all the complications. There's no need for that. No need whatsoever. Bernstein, R.D. Dykeman, Jason Fung, they all know if you control your carbohydrate, eat your meat or keep your glucose down, uh, don't become insulin resistant as a type 1, don't provoke your insulin resistance as a type 2, you can live a full life expectancy, you can keep your feet and your hands and your eyes, and there's no problem. That's completely available for anyone and still eat delicious, nutritious, ancestral foods, cheeses, meats, fish, all the nice stuff. Uh, No problem. Mm. But look what we've got instead. Yeah. So I'm going to recap your advice for anyone who you know uh, in your life, listener, somebody who might be obese, but yet their blood sugar is good. 
And they say, no, my blood sugar is fine, but there's a good chance that their insulin is out of whack. And so all you do is you have them drink 75. Now, where does one get glucose? Can you get pure glucose? In, uh, so you drink 75 grams of glucose and then two hours later get a blood test with insulin and uh, look at the markers. If it's between 20 and 30, you've got a problem, right? Uh, well, if, it, if you're below 30, okay. If you're above 40, not okay. Oh, between 30 and 40. 30 and 40 is, is the gray area where you're not sure. But okay. most people will either be under or over. So uh, the glu- I haven't sourced the glucose, but I think in a pharmacy or chemist, you can get just pure glucose powder and yeah. it's 75 grams. And I think they also have the drinks. People can look it up. They have the drinks that are made for the oral glucose tolerance test. I've seen them actually in the pharmacies, you know, CVS and Rite Aid and even some supermarkets I've seen them before. So how about somebody who's uh, on a low-carb diet and they've, uh, they've, they're fat-adapted and they're glucose-sparing? What are, if they do this test, obviously their body's not going to behave in the same way with that glucose challenge. So what do they do? Right. Well, that's a very special case. Um, so pattern one is healthy, right, below 30 at, at two hours. Pattern two, three, and four are various types of hyperinsulin, high insulin response with a long delayed fall off. And then there's pattern five. Now, pattern five is a very low insulin response, okay? Mm. And pattern five can be a couple of different things. It could be a type one diabetic who's not producing insulin, right? They get a low response. Or it can be a low carber, just as you describe, Richard. So a low carber often will come in with a very low response of insulin because the machinery is not really geared up for a sudden load of glucose. So the insulin response is quite low. And likewise, they can get quite a high glucose spike in the blood for the same reason. So I like to think of it as a low carber. It's like your body is like a spring and it's holding back the glucose from the muscle cells to spare it for the brain, which is great. But if, you ha- if you're pushing against this door, holding the glucose back in the blood and, and out of the muscle, right, to spare it, what happens if suddenly you flood your blood with glucose? Well, then there's going to be an overshoot, right? And there is. So what they will tend to do, low carbers, is get a very low insulin response, pattern five, um, and they will get quite a high glucose. Now, what Kraft used to do to overcome this problem is he'd put people for two weeks on a higher carb diet, right? He'd take low carbers, put them for a couple of weeks on a higher carb diet and let their machinery level out. And then he'd know, I'm not going to get any false pattern fives. So how much is a higher carb diet? If you're on a 25 or 20 grams of carbs a day, a ketogenic diet, what are you going up to 150 or something in that area? Yeah, I can't remember the exact figure, but a couple of hundred, you're talking about a classic standard pyramid diet, a couple of hundred grams of carbs. Now, you may be able to only take a hundred to achieve it. You may do it in two or three days, but Kraft played safe, gave him plenty of carb, standard diet, a couple of weeks because he wanted good data. But I think a few days with native peoples, people, when they do oral glucose tolerances, um, I think they give two, 250 grams a day for three or four days uh, to not get a bad oral glucose result. So let's remind people also that if you're a type 2 diabetic already, you know you're, you don't need the craft test. You know you're, you've got a problem with insulin. Absolutely. This, this is not for knowledgeable, smart, low-carbers who know what they're doing. Right. This is for their kids. Yeah, or it's just generally for people who don't really know what's going on. They're eating a standard food pyramid dietary guidelines diet. They've got a cult or diabetes in situ. And this test will show you, hey, you've, you've got diabetes on the way. Whereas most low carbers know exactly what they're doing. They're doing everything right. They don't really need to do a craft test. They can do it. Be nice. You see yourself come in with pattern five. You say, way. But um, (laughs) it's more for the people who aren't sure, who are eating a mixed diet and don't know where they stand. So let's say you're an obese person and you're listening to this and your glucose is good. Otherwise, you you do the glucose test, you know, without your doctor knowing. You get an insulin test two hours after taking the glucose and it does come back 40 or higher. 
So you know you're in the danger zone. Now, here's the question. Is going on a ketogenic diet, which reduces your sugar, also going to do as good a job at reducing your insulin? Uh, absolutely. From what we know, and again, we don't have all the data. No one has a monopoly on, on the, the final truth. But overwhelmingly, what happens is in a ketogenic diet, after a short while, when you fat adapt, your insulin response to glucose will fall right off. And that's what Kraft saw in all the patients where he lowered the carbohydrate, not even ketogenic. I'm not sure exactly what he used for low carb. It was pretty low carb. He switched them all back to pattern five, low insulin response. So hmm. there's other causes of heart disease, I guess. Kraft believed that hyperinsulinemia slash diabetes was the cause of nearly all cardiovascular disease. And he could be correct. But I'd like to hedge and say, if you fix your insulin response and you get out of diabetes, I think if your omega-3, omega-6 ratio is really poor, you may still get atherosclerosis. If your vitamin D is in the toilet, you may still have problems with inflammation and endothelial distress. But broadly speaking, the big thing to fix is to get pass a craft test. You're non-diabetic then, you've taken away the primary cause of issues, and you'll also tend to fix all your cholesterol ratios by doing that, like we know. Triglycerides down, mm -hmm. HDL up, ApoB over ApoA1 in the advanced tests, they're all going to go to the right place. And all your liver enzymes on a low-carb diet, your GGT, your ALT, they're all going to go right down. The beauty of a low-carb diet properly done is it nearly fixes every <laughs> metric. As we saw in <laughs> Professor Volokh's work, Jeff Volokh, his study of around 10 inflammatory markers and all the cholesterol metrics on a whole bunch of overweight pre-diabetic men, nearly every, no, not nearly, every single marker of around 20 all went to the good place on the low-carb ketogenic versus the standard diet. Yeah. I mean... It's outrageous. It's outrageous. And it's almost embarrassing, as Richard Morris says, how many uh, spoils of, uh, <laughs> of health we enjoy as keto low-carbers. Ivor, I want to thank you very much. This is fantastic. Thank you for your interview with Dr. Kraft. Thanks for bringing the yeah. awareness of this assay to everybody. And now we finally have a way that you can hack the system and uh, find out for yourself without your doctor even knowing. So thanks again. Thanks very much, Carol Richard. Always a pleasure. Great stuff. And we'll, hey, we'll see you at the Keto Fest next year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's going to be a great, and you know, I might just say, there's so many conferences and there's a lot of doctors and lay people and they're all stuck in rooms all day listening to talks and it's great. But I mean, this is a fantastic idea to have some fun and get out there and have a festival. So that's going to be my favorite one of 17, I think. All day bacon bar. Hey, woo. woo. <laughs> We're going to turn an entire town in America keto for an entire weekend. We have the mayor involved. We have yeah. all the restaurants involved. This is going going to be fun. It's already starting. Yeah. Excellent. Hi, guys. Thanks again. We'll see you later. I don't know about you, Richard, but I'm getting pretty pissed off. Oh, I know. It's frustrating. It's just I, put it, the good news is that we managed to get our own way out of the cul-de-sac that's diabetes. So, um, yeah. and, and by sharing this information with other people and then being able to share it with their friends and loved ones, this is an opportunity to basically create a grassroots uh, uh, movement uh, of all of us away from diabetes. And yeah. the craft insulin test that Iva has basically publicized uh, off his own bat and has done such a wonderful job at is going to make a big difference. It's going to let sure us see. Is. It's going to let us see diabetes twenty years before it happens. Absolutely. Okay. Well, with that, folks, we're going to start eating because it's time for <laughs> recipes. 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 Oh, okay. I'm going to go first. I have. All right. So I'm inspired by Janice's mail about her school lunches, where every meal seemed to have a buttered vegetable. Right. Well, I've discovered a uh, way of butter poaching cauliflower, which is awesome. What? 
Yes, I know. So what I do is I I get a head of cauliflower and I cut off the small. I cut basically carve off florets with a small knife. So I'm basically creating small little packets of cauliflower, and yeah. I I put them in the microwave. Just don't don't need water. Just put it in the microwave for a minute to basically soften them. So now I have softened florets of cauliflower, but. That's pretty bland. Now, I, f- yeah. I found the ideal way of cooking this. So for about <laughs> uh, 100 grams of uh, florets of cauliflower, I get about 30 grams of butter, and I put it in a small saucier, uh, which is a small pan for making sauces. Yeah. And I melt that butter, and I get it just blipping just a little bit. It's not really boiling. It's just every <laughs> now and then there's a little blip of of, it's uh, talking to it's you. Talking. It's going. It's 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 flirting with me, <laughs> and it's exactly what it's doing, blipping. <laughs> and so what I do is I put the cauliflower in, florette side down, stalk side uh-huh. up. So I can do this with my fingers, and I basically layer the entire bottom of the saucier with uh, with this cauliflower, and it starts soaking up the butter. It's almost like confiting cauliflower. Huh? Yeah, in right. Butter, or well, I guess. Butter poaching. Okay, I'm going to call it butter butter poached cauliflower. Yeah, sure. And and then I sprinkle a little bit of salt over the top of it, and I just let it sit there for for uh, five ten minutes. And basically, what I'm doing is every now and then I pick up a floret to see if the if the surface of the floret is going brown. And brown, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll share video. I'll share pictures on my blog. Uh, of what that should look like and when you've taken it too far. But basically mm. you're just golden brown. You're getting the surface of this cauliflower golden brown. And because it's going to soak up all of this butter, you're going to be left with a, a fair bit of butter left over in the pan. Sure. But which you can pour just toss. It over. You know, it's, you pour it over or you toss it into a sauce. It's now it's now cauliflower yeah. flavoured butter, which is awesome. But these Great. little cauliflower florets, they're just golden and they're absolutely infused with butter. Um, and, and, you know, it's a uh, little, little, Pots of keto goodness, and this is how we like to have our carbohydrates <laughs> in trace amounts and with lots of butter. Yeah, exactly. Well done, sir. That's my recipe. So, what have you got for us, Carl? Well, this one comes from our good friend Brenda Zorn. She yeah. was on uh, show twenty-one. I think she it was. was. Yeah, yeah. Um, a good friend, and she's also an admin in our Facebook group, and just uh, an unwavering. Uh, inspiration for us all. Sure she is. Um, This was posted today in the Facebook group, Coconut Flour Cheddar Drop Biscuits. Mm. Now, I haven't made these, but like I told you before, I don't even need to. I can tell from what they're made from (laughs) that they're awesome. So so a biscuit is uh, otherwise known outside of America as a scone. We would call it a scone. The Brits call it cookies biscuits. That's it. And so do we. They call them biscuits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is like a scone uh, in the UK. Right. Well, they're called they're called biscuits in biscuits. America. <laughs> yeah. Biscuits with gravy. Yeah. So what you do is you take a quarter of a cup of coconut oil or butter melted. I, mm-hmm. you know, given a choice, coconut oil is probably healthier for you, but I love the taste of butter. Yeah, me too. Uh, a third of a cup of sifted coconut flour. Okay. Yep. Coconut flour. A third of a cup. Four eggs quarter teaspoon of salt, quarter teaspoon of onion powder, quarter teaspoon of baking powder, and a half a cup to a third of a cup of sharp cheddar cheese shredded. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I can tell just from (laughs) this ingredient (laughs) list, these are going to be awesome. Yeah. So blend together the eggs, coconut oil or butter, salt, and onion powder. And you combine the coconut flour with the baking powder and whisk it into the batter until there are no lumps. And now you fold in the cheese mm. and drop that batter by the spoonful onto a greased cookie sheet and bake it 400 degrees for only 15 minutes. And you get about 10 biscuits out of that. Mm, nice. <laughs> now, since she posted that, our group has gone ballistic with, <laughs> oh my God, I got to try it. Somebody made them right then and there and they came out and the testimonial was, oh my God, these are great. Somebody made a bacon avocado sandwich with them. Oh, nice. And Brenda is saying, yeah, you should. You haven't lived until you've had them as hamburger buns or cheeseburger yeah. buns, right? Yeah. I intend on making um, egg, cheese, sausage biscuits in the morning. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you could you could, <laughs> you could do them in the the upside down muffin pans that you use for you making your Opsy bread. So you could make uh, you could make um, you could make burger buns with them. <laughs> yeah, and you know even if you spoon them out, they sort of flatten out. So yeah, they they'd be just fine without that pan. But I'll probably use it. Yeah, yeah. They go well with uh, butter poached cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> it would actually. <laughs> Well, we, uh, you know, we didn't want to make you too angry, so we left you with some biscuits and yeah. some butter poached cauliflower. But uh, that's a show. But, of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute what we've said, please send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. You can tweet us at twoketodudes. You can follow us on Instagram at twoketodudes. And um, that's about it. I think we're just about everywhere. Our Facebook group, fb.2keto.com. So normally at this time of the show, I'd say something like keep calm and keto on, but I'm a little bit angry today. So what I'm going to say is <laughs> don't get angry, fix yourself, and then fix somebody else. Yeah, that's right. Change the world. Start with yourself. Hey, <laughs> we'll see you next time on Two, Two Keto, keto Dudes. Dudes.